There's a new world coming. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a new world coming. To a new world coming. To a new world coming. Hello, and welcome to the seventh episode of New World Coming, a political education interview series produced by the People's Forum. In this installation, James Early speaks with historian, author, and activist Barbara Ransby. She's a professor at the University of Chicago, one of the founding and coordinating members of the Black Radical Congress, and the author of Making All Black Lives Matter, Islanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson, and other important works. In this interview, she and James discuss the legacy and influence of the Black radical tradition, a school of thought that fundamentally sees racial capitalism as the underlying structure of oppression against people's freedom and liberation. However, Barbara reminds us that heteropatriarchy is one of the major pillars of this unjust system and that no inclusive emancipatory projects can exist without feminism and women's power. They also talk about the importance of many fronts of struggle, how, as Barbara says, the electoral is necessary but insufficient, and a strong people's movement will bring together many different formations and organizations and be waged in all arenas of power. Finally, she talks about internationalism and international solidarity as an essential part of the black liberation struggle here in the United States. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see more educational and cultural content, and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on future events and episodes. Thank you and enjoy the interview. Welcome to this edition of the People's Forum Political Education Interview Series, New World Coming. My name is James Early and I'm your host. We're pleased and excited to welcome Dr. Barbara Ransby, historian, writer, professor, social justice activist, and organizer, all identity markers grounded in the history and contemporary expressions of the black radical tradition. Dr. Ransby holds the John D. MacArthur Chair at the University of Illinois in Chicago, where she is a professor of African American Studies, Gender, and Women's Studies. She is an elected fellow of the Society of American Historians, and in, 19, in 2016, she was elected for two terms as president of the National Association of Women's Studies. She is one of the five founding initiators of the Black Radical Congress in 1996 and became one of its main organizers. She's the author of many notable works, uh, particularly two works on African-American women activists in the 20th century, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision, and Islanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson. She is also the author of All Black Lives Matter, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century. Welcome, Barbara. Well, thank you for thank you for having me uh, in this and, and for the work that you're doing with the People's Forum. I really um, think it's so important creating this space for discussion and debate and conversation and political education uh, that the uh, People's Forum provides. And, and even those of us aren't, who aren't in New York or on the East Coast uh, benefit from the programming. So this is this is great. Barbara, welcome, and thank you so much for sharing your, your time with us. Uh, I want to get uh, right into asking you if you would give us just a, a kind of introductory description of what is the Black Radical tradition, and uh, how have you been influenced in your own ideological and, and academic and social justice uh, organizing work uh, by that tradition, specifically in your history with... with um, the father of, sometimes described as the father of, uh, the, of the black radical tradition, Cedric Robinson, author of uh, Black Marxism and the, uh, and the black radical tradition. Yeah. Um, so the black radical tradition, it's, um, it's a capacious uh, term and Cedric is most associated with coining the term, but it really talks about all the myriad of ways that, that black people have struggled to be free, really. Um, struggled against oppression, sought transformative change. Um, we can't talk about a narrow black radical tradition. And it's also a contentious tradition, right? We don't always agree with each other about how to get free. Um, 20 years ago or so, a little over 20 years ago, I was a part of uh, the Black Radical Congress. And we talked about three major strains 
of a black radical tradition. One is, of course, Marxist, socialists, and communists, people who see uh, capitalism as a critical obstacle to, uh, to black freedom and liberation, to all people's freedom and liberation, um, and, and have a particular tradition out of which Marxists and socialists and communists overlap, but aren't all the same thing, as you know. Um, and then there's the revolutionary nationalist tradition, which has also sought transformative change but through a kind of nationalist and sometimes pan-Africanist lens. Uh, and then there's a tradition of black feminism and, and all of these overlap. I mean, they're not, they're, they're, they are porous categories. So the black feminist tradition really insists on identifying heteropatriarchy as one of the pillars of an unjust system and that you know, no revolution, no social transformation uh, can be complete in terms of a liberatory agenda if we don't have a feminist politic uh, integrated into it. And I always like to say, you know, and maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, this, this category called identity politics, but sometimes people coming out of a black feminist tradition are associated with identity politics. But really when you think about the Combahee River Collective who were radical anti-colonial socialists, uh, when you think of even Bell Hooks, you know, staunch critic of capitalism, uh, many of the loudest voices, most influential voices and organizers in the black feminist tradition, you know, have also been socialist and anti-capitalist. So, um, and some of them nationalists as well. But, um, but so those are the kind of tendencies that I see in a black radical tradition. Um, and we often debate and, and, and struggle around what is the path forward? What kind of strategies uh, really make sense in terms of uh, getting us from under the system that we're under? I think of really having been influenced by all three. So I, I grew up, I think, you know, in Detroit in the 1970s, which is kind of a hell of time to grow up in Detroit. Um, you know, there was, you know, General Baker, which I think one of the rooms at the People's Forum is named after. Um, there was uh, people like Walter Riley, who's doing wonderful Haiti solidarity work on the West Coast, who was very influential in my thinking. Um, there were, you know, James and Grace Lee Boggs, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, Black Panther Party had a, had a chapter there, various kinds of left and Marxist study groups and organizations. So I was really influenced by, by all of those, as well as writers like James Baldwin and Toni Morrison, who just, you know, love Black people and celebrated a kind of culture of resistance and self-definition that, uh, that is so important to the Black radical tradition. Well, I, I, I think getting into this identity question, which is one of the issues certainly that our generation, I think I may be a, a few years older than you, but our generation, <laughs> that, <laughs> that our generation struggle with, are you a Marxist? Are you a historical materialist? Are you a feminist? Um, this labeling issue, I think this generation uh, of young activists with whom I'm generally impressed with, are also engaging mm -hmm. some of these definitional issues. Um, so would, how do you identify yourself? Or do you use identifiers like a, being a Marxist or a feminist? Or what is the significance or lack thereof from your vantage point? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I was reminded, I did look at one of the earlier interviews you did with my, my dear friend and comrade, Robin Kelly. And uh, Robin is so articulate in, in talking about this and certainly your own writing and practice over many years is that these categories are porous um, and that we, we can't be rigid or dogmatic about them. I do think there is a use for labels though. You know, people say, well, I just, you know, believe what I believe and I might change. And, you know, there's a discipline that is helpful when we try to say, I situate myself in this tradition um, because it, it means I've read certain texts and I more or less agree with them. It means that I associate with people who have fought under this banner, et cetera. Uh, so I consider myself a, a, a black feminist, a radical democratic socialist, which is not to say a DSA democratic socialist, but a socialist who believes that democratic processes have to uh, govern our movements and, um, and our work. And I'm an internationalist. Uh, and so I think those are probably the labels I'm most comfortable with. Certainly Marx has inter, you know, influenced my thinking enormously as one of the preeminent critics and uh, analysts of capitalism. Uh, but I think you know, Marx has been 
dead almost 140 years. So, you know, if we see Marxism as a living science, obviously it's not going to be frozen in time. And obviously someone who died 140 years ago is not going to uh, understand how to remake the world that we live in. So, um, so I'm, you know, influenced by Marx. I'm influenced by Gramsci. I'm influenced by Walter Rodney, Claudia Jones, but also, like I said, you know, many writers uh, and poets who would not necessarily consider themselves Marxist. And in that context, you are one of the renowned national and international historians and in the discipline of history. Uh, would you comment on how you see the use of the discipline of history uh, for social justice activists and organizers and the role of the academy um, uh, in that context? We, we're in a period where people still talk about the public intellectual, where individuals are highlighted but very little is addressed in these discourses about the disciplines that they bring uh, to this arena. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, I think most of us who consider ourselves radical thinkers and most of us who are, who are black academics have a very ambivalent relationship to the academy. Um, university spaces are um, spaces where we sometimes have wiggle room and have a little bit of autonomy, but they're also confining spaces in terms of, um, you know, the, the hoops that people have to jump through to have a job, to have a career. And we see now, you know, attacks on uh, radical thinkers, particularly around the question of Palestine, but also around what gets termed critical race theory. But that really is any, you know, anything that is talking about Black people in struggle. Uh, and, and, and critique of the society is, you know, kind of thrown under that label. But it's always been an ambivalent relationship. I see the university as a site of struggle. Um, and I, I have always uh, thought it was really important to have intellectual community outside of the confines of a university uh, campus. Some of the most brilliant people that I've, you know, worked with, organized with, learned from uh, are people who are not uh, credentialed academics. You know, many of my comrades in South Africa during the anti-apartheid era who hadn't even finished their schooling because they were so immersed in the struggle there, but they were well-read, widely read, you know, deep, rigorous thinkers um, asking all kinds of important questions and answering a lot of them. So, um, so that's, you know, kind of my take on, on the university. In terms of history, uh, I became a historian because I wanted to understand how to change the world. And uh, I was a, a bit naive to think that I was going to go into university and get all those answers. Uh, but really, you know, history is a study of change over time. And so if we are not satisfied with the way things are, we can be pretty much guaranteed that things will be different in 10, 20, 50 years. And the question is, what role will we play in that history making? So history for me is very, um, it's uplifting. It's a source of optimism, even though, of course, there's some horror stories in our history. But the fact that people constantly resisted and forged uh, a different way, a different path, you know, winning some and losing some, you know, I find great inspiration in, in that kind of uh, determination. I'll also say in terms of my practice, you know, there are two projects I'm involved in now that... Uh, push this idea of, of a different, different way of thinking about our intellectual work and obligations, um, which is looking outward, not inward, not necessarily uh, at tuition paying students, which universities increasingly see as customers and clients, but rather at, um, you know, at a community of social change agents. So I, like you, you know, do a lot of work with, with young people and I'm a student as well as a teacher in those spaces and also work with other um, scholars and, and researchers who wanna work on the margins of or sometimes outside of university spaces. So Kathy Cohen and I uh, co-founded this group called Scholars for Social Justice. And we've been doing things around, um, well, we did a whole program around universities and reparations. We've done something around Devarian Baldwin's new book about the ways in which universities serve as kind of economic predators on urban communities. Uh, and we have been to, uh, you know, working with the Cops Off Campus Coalition. So that's one project. And the other one I'll just say briefly is something called the Portal Project, which is taken from a quote uh, 
uh, from Arundhati Roy, which talks about the pandemic as portal. And it's a group of activists, artists, and scholars who've made a two-year commitment to be in working groups and dialogues and symposia asking the question, what does a just transition uh, look like in this moment? And how do we analyze the crisis of racial capitalism in this moment? And so both of those are non-traditional intellectual projects that um, kind of, I think, push the bounds of the university in important ways that give us some breathing room. You know, one of the uh, theoretical frameworks that I was trained around and that is still under a lot of debate, and particularly as we look at um, the U.S. today, are really as we look at uh, global affairs and we're literally millions of working people in this nation and in other nations are voting for right-wing, racist, homophobic, fascist. And it comes into clash with this sort of mechanistic way that I was exposed to this notion that the working class is the motive force of history. Talk to us a little about your thinking about at least the United States for the moment and how this class issue, working class issue, is being played out or what, what valence uh, might we give to it in relationship to some of these other socially historically formed identity issues like the anti-racist struggle or the anti-misogynist struggle or the struggle against homophobia? Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, capitalism's changing and the nature of working class life is changing. So that's, that's one thing we can talk about those changes too. Um, but I think we have seen the growth of uh, the resurgence, not the emergence, but the resurgence of um, kind of white nationalism. And in some ways, white nationalism is being deployed to save racial capitalism. That is, if you can get enough white workers to buy into uh, this vision that we are their problem or immigrants are their problem, um, then and, and willing to fight for that and the militia that are organizing and the you know, the Trumpist uh, uh, neo-fascists that are mobilizing, you know, they're prepared to fight for these ideas. And, and we have to admit white working class people are being won to these ideas. So that's a very, you know, sobering uh, uh, thing. I think we do need multiracial unity. We do need to build broad bases, but it has to be built not by looking away from race and the damage that it's done, but by confronting it and dealing with it white people have to be one to anti-racist, uh, anti-capitalist view. And this was some of us who supported, you know, Bernie Sanders in the, in the last presidential round, you know, made this struggle and made this um, point inside that campaign and, and didn't get enough traction, quite frankly, you know, that it's, it can't just be a class reductionist position. It has to be uh, a position that understands we're all in the same boat, but some of us are in the hull of the ship and some of us might be up on deck. Uh, and that racism has been the force that all, you know, not only justifies super exploitation of workers of color, uh, but also divides uh, the working class. And the unity we build has to be a principled anti-racist unity, not a unity of convenience or glossing over. So that's kind of, I guess, how I see the class question at this moment. You know, in that context, one of the things that I'm witnessing and there is I would say a lot of confusion around is historically women have been excluded from equal access in the public space. And if you're a woman of color or if you're a working class woman or if you're an indigenous woman, uh, that uh, is amplified. Um, now we have uh, a black woman who represents the Biden-Harris administration at the UN. We have a black man who represents the military industrial uh, complex. Uh, we have uh, a gay white American who occupies a major cabinet post in the in the Biden Harris administration. On the one so hand, we won, right, James? It, well, well, it's <laughs> that 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 therein lies the question. It seems to me, on the one hand, we can't totally dismiss this as they are simply. Uh, to use a sexist phraseology, handmaidens uh, of the elite, uh, because uh, there is a democratic dimension to their advance. But it is very confusing to a lot of people of how to handle that. Um, mm -hmm. I just saw Kamala Harris uh, saying we uphold the integrity of, of Israel um, without mentioning the Palestinians uh, at, yeah. at, at all. 
how, yeah. how might you advise a younger generation of activists uh, how they might engage the complexities uh, of these uh, democratic issues? Yeah. Well, you know, we have a multiracial ruling class and we still have white supremacy and racial capitalism. And I think actually this generation of organizers get that. I mean, it's not insignificant that the largest protest movement uh, since the 1960s and early 70s, uh, the explosion of uprisings around the murder of Mike Brown and later, um, uh, you know, others. But, but, but Mike Brown's, um, you know, the Ferguson uprising occurred under our first black president. So, you know, young people weren't seduced to think, oh, well, we've, you know, we've got our guy in the White House, we're okay. In fact, when I interviewed a lot of my, you know, fellow activists, but of a generate different generation uh, for the book on making all black lives matter. I mean, they, some of them said they were disappointed. In other words, they had hoped that Barack Obama would represent more change than he did. And others weren't, um, you know, confused at all and weren't, weren't disappointed because they hadn't had that expectation. In the struggle in Baltimore around Freddie Gray, you know, several of the, the cops who were um, responsible for the death of Freddie Gray right. were black cops. Right. So, you know, the campaign around um, police violence has been a black working class campaign. It has been a campaign that has um, upheld the dignity of poor and black working class people who are the targets of police violence. And I think that's important to, to note, you know, that the people who are most vulnerable, the George Floyds of the world, the Mike Browns of the world are folks who are living on the edges, you know, uh, of the economy, often working in the informal economy, um, having had contact with police and prisons before, et cetera. So, the fact that the movement has chose to champion the uh, lives of people who have been assaulted by the police, that particular group in our community, you know, is very important. And I think politically savvy about this idea that representation uh, is not what we're after. Uh, and, and of course, you know, part of the deal has been black and brown faces in high places, right. but no redistributive justice and certainly no transformative justice. And, I, and that's what I hear as a demand, the expectation, the freedom dream of this generation uh, of activists, not all of them, not all of them. I'm not gonna romanticize mm -hmm. and I'm not gonna fetishize you because there's some right wing young people too, yeah, right? Yeah, and right, there's some right. get over however I can young people. So let's just be real. But there is a really important core of amazing young freedom fighters who do have this analysis. Um, and it's sharper than, you know, I think sharper in some ways than previous generations. Um, so we'll see where it leads. We're up against a pretty ruthless uh, opposition. You have been one of the veterans, I'm going to say, in the progressive and radical transformation movement in this country and in your international work. Uh, that has not only set forth to try and document, for example, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, but also one who has volunteered to become an interlocutor uh, to help complement the perspectives and the energies that these young people are putting forward. I think I find that in contrast to a number of people in, in our age cohort who say, well, you know, these young people are just not doing anything what would you say to our generation about what our responsibility should be uh, in, re in, in, in regard to this new generation who is occupying the public space? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I often quote this young woman in Ferguson uh, who I talked to, and she, she contrasted two quote unquote elders who came to Ferguson during the height of the uprising. And the young organizers there, some of them in this kind of um, street-based street group called Lost Voices, um, they, they had a very different reaction to say an Angela Davis who came versus an Al Sharpton who came. And I said, well, you know, Angela's actually older than Al Sharpton. So right. it's not just about age. Right. So she said, no, she said, she didn't come to mold us and scold us. And so I thought about that and I said, well, I'm gonna take that as my mantra. I want to be a well-behaved elder <laughs> and not shake my finger 
and say, you need to do this, you need to do this. And also not say that I know everything because, you know, we don't. Um, we know some things and I think we, we have to find ways to share our experiences and knowledge um, that is not, you know, arrogant or condescending. Um, that, that's very important how we present what we have to offer. So, and I think, you know, that pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will is really important in this moment because uh, young people I work with and some of the older people I work with do break my heart sometimes um, and, 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 and don't step up when I'm hoping they will step up or don't speak out when I hope they will speak out or make mistakes and do things that, you know, I think set us back. Um, but I think we have to have grace and forgiveness uh, if, if we feel people are generally trying to be principled and on the right track. And so there has to be kind of a loving and principled struggle that goes on and, uh, and perseverance. So I don't know, that sounds like a sermon or something, doesn't it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, again, your relationship to the broad uh, and diverse and sometimes complex and complicated dimensions of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, it seems to me is a, a model direction um, that our, our generation needs to take. There are some who have said, well, you know, this is another identity formation. It's not getting to the class question. Uh, we saw a not only a national manifestation around uh, that was cross-cultural, cross-racial, cross-class around the killing of George Floyd and the leadership initiative uh, taken to the streets uh, principally by these young activists, but we saw a global movement. Uh, this movement has also uplifted the question, it seems to me, of Palestine uh, in, a, in a way that many in our generation had clear ideological perspectives, but were very uneasy, even anxious about to what extent we could step into the public space and articulate that. Would you give us your views on, on these, these two internationally connected movements and the significance yeah. of them at this moment? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, in the 2016 Vision for Black Lives statement, which, which kind of laid out um, some of the views of the movement for Black Lives, and people should know, and probably most of your listeners, you know, do know um, that when we talk about Black Lives Matter or the movement for Black, movement for Black Lives is a, is a very specific coalition of multiple groups. There are some uh, Black Lives Matter chapters in the movement for Black Lives, but it's, it's not the same thing. And then the Black Lives Matter Global Network, um, you know, it came out of another ver a very specific trajectory around, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter hashtag and then chapters were formed and uh, so forth. So anyway, so it's important to know the kind of um, cartography of the movement a little bit too. But the movement for Black Lives, which is the formation that I work with, um, you know, has, has been very conscious from early on about internationalism. Um, the 2016 Visions for Black Lives document uh, made a statement in solidarity with Palestine. Uh, the Dream Defenders, which has, you know, been an important organization since the Tra Trayvon Martin murder and the George Zimmerman acquittal, uh, sent delegations to Palestine, had, you know, Palestinian uh, member, member as one of their founders. So Palestine has been an important uh, point to speak out on and not be silenced around. And I think that's important. I, my own, you know, history on this issue is an issue very close to my heart and, uh, you know, went on a delegation in 2011 and um, has, you know, really tried to inform my work. But they've also had contact with the Landless People's Movement in Brazil, with the Fees Must Fall Movement in South Africa. A couple of us went to Haiti a number of years ago to try to make contact there. Uh, with, with organizations um, on the ground. So, so there has been this internationalist perspective and in trying to be in principled solidarity. A number of statements have been issued. Um, I really, and you might have thoughts about this because you know your work is such um, so exemplary in terms of a broad uh, internationalist perspective, you know, how we do principled international solidarity work. Um, in this period. I mean, people send delegations, make statements, try to form transnational 
formations to the degree that they can. Um, it, but it's difficult, difficult and important um, at the same time. But, I, but as a principle, yes, you know, there has definitely been uh, internationalism as a critical component of the work. You described yourself as a democratic socialist, uh, not as in, dis in distinction to DSA. I did not understand that to be a critique or a put down. Uh, no. But the, the trend of politics, uh, of ideological outlook and practical policy politics uh, has emerged in this country. And it seems to me that it's one that many activists, older and younger, uh, sometimes simply dismiss or observe in ideological terms rather than the reality for what it has brought in terms of local elected officials that literally thousands, if not millions of people across the country identify these as the stewards of policy representation that they choose. And of course, uh, the gender issue is a very powerful one with these women either who are openly members of DSA or who at least share the same uh, social democratic policies uh, that do affect the lives of everyday people. What's your mm -hmm. sense of, of, of how to assess this and how to engage this, this phenomenon? Yeah, I, I think, you know, electoral politics is um, been very interesting in recent years, right, for the reasons that you're uh, outlining. I, I love the squad we've done events with and for them. Um, Rashida Tlaib is a dear sister and friend. Um, I think, you know, electoral work is necessary and insufficient. And I think we have to say both of those things. We still need to build, build movements. We cannot just elect our way to freedom. Um, we have to build people's movements, you know, neighborhood organizations, unions, uh, feminist formations. We, we need lots of different organizational formations and lots of arenas of struggle uh, and cultural arenas as well of struggle uh, in addition to the electoral arena. So that said as a kind of preface, but I think, you know, DSA, Working Families Party, uh, uh, Justice Democrats have really pushed back against the centrist Democrats and the Democratic Party um, in ways that we just really have not seen before. And so it creates um, a, a critical tension inside the Democratic Party. Now, the last time I talked about this, I had a <laughs> friend call me and say, you're supporting the Democratic Party. I'm so disappointed in you. I expect so much of you. I said, you're not listening, brother. You're not listening, um, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you know that is an arena of struggle, like the racist universities are arenas of struggle. And um, you know, it is, a lot of it is defensive work and harm reduction work, you know, to to get bills passed that you know allow more of our people to eat, and you know takes the takes the weight of a knee off of our neck, you know that is that is a survival strategy, a harm reduction strategy. It is not a transform the world strategy, right? Uh, but it is part of it. So I think we have to, you know, we on the left, you know, we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. So just because we say you know, vote for the lesser of two evils or vote for somebody who uh, represents a progressive that is not a radical uh, platform that's going to push back against this white nationalist onslaught doesn't mean you're selling out or giving up. We used to juxtapose reform versus revolution. And I think we have to think of some kinds of reforms as important. And so it means reform and revolution, but we're right. not having a revolution right. right now. Revolution is a process. So, um, you know, I, I just think thinking in these binary terms are not helpful and thinking with a rigid dogmatism is not helpful. And sometimes when people write off uh, any kind of electoral work that might ameliorate suffering, you know, it is from a position of privilege because if you say, oh, you're just fighting for those crumbs. You got one more dollar. Well, if you got $50, one more dollar might not seem like much. If you only got $3, one dollar actually may mean that your kids eat two meals instead of one meal a day. So I, I, I just think we, we have to tread lightly. We have to have a nuanced approach, um, definitely keeping our eyes on the North Star, but, um, but also dealing with bread and butter issues in the now.
It, I, for me, you make some very uh, elucidating perspectives here. I tend to think of it as progressive reforms versus reformism. And that underneath this, what we are really seeing is a reflection of the consciousness of millions of ordinary people. It is what it is, and it will not change unless they engage it at a practical level. And that those of us who think that we have a deeper analytical view of how to resolve this uh, should be very careful in trying to impose our abstract ideas uh, up against the actual consciousness of, 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 of ordinary people. And I know that this is one of the issues that are not only a lot of younger activists are struggling with in their practice, but older actress, uh, uh, activists about how to deal uh, with the fact that millions of ordinary people uh, have invested their consciousness in the instrumentality of the Democratic Party, uh, which is less about the leadership of that party than it is about it is a contending force with the white supremacist, racist, homophobic fascism that we're facing mm -hmm. coming from the other party where millions of Americans are also organized around. Yeah. And when, when I said, uh, you know, I mean, and I, I can't actually, I don't remember who, who said this, but I repeat it quite a lot. You know, the idea of working inside, outside, and against the state, um, that I think that's an important strategic frame for understanding uh, understanding the work. You know, here in Chicago, we have a city council where we had at one point with nine um, democratic socialists who all of whom I support, um, who are on the city council. And, you know, every time we had a demonstration, somebody was arrested, we, we called them to come to help get the person out of jail, right? So it wasn't like you're over there doing this, and people are in the street doing this, there was a sense of relationality and commitment. And people came out, you know, Rosana Rodriguez here, a wonderful, you know, Puerto Rican activist and city council person in DSA, she come out at midnight, you know, to get out of bed and come out and, 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 and use her title and position to get access to make sure people are okay, um, et cetera. That's strategic, you know, it's not like she's leading us to freedom. Uh, but it's strategic and she realizes she's in service to a bigger movement and not just, uh, you know, certainly not the Democratic Party. But um, the other thing I'll say about coalitions, you know, and, and uh, a very, very broad coalition, multiple coalitions came together to defeat Trump in the last presidential election. But then, of course, immediately after the election, there was a kind of refragmentation, and we've seen this in the past, you know, the United Front Against Fascism, you know, in World War II era. Afterwards, we saw the Cold War McCarthyism and uh, a kind of liberal attack on radicals who had been allies only moments before. So I think we have to think on all these levels at once. It doesn't mean that we uh, then have, <clears throat> excuse me, black and white positions but it means that we are anticipating and seeing, you know, in one context, we may be able to have alliances, but we understand that the fundamental vision and principles are not aligned and we have to continue. We might get somebody elected and then the next day have a protest to push them, you know, to do things they don't want to do. So, um, you know, just to hold all that at the same time, I think is an important challenge and an important talent for serious organizers. Well, perhaps to round out our interview, I identify with your uh, self-descriptor as a, a democratic socialist uh, in terms of the construction of socialism, not uh, how to harmonize uh, the ragged edges uh, between labor and capital, which is the more classic uh, orientation towards, uh, at least from Europe, as we would understand dem a democratic socialist. Tied to that, I am very impressed by the fact that uh, over the last three or four years that a number of polls have shown that there are literally millions of young adults in this country who identify with some perspective about socialism in obvious contrast to what they understand the practical implications of capitalism if they're not dealing with, dealing with it theoretically. But on the question of the construction of socialism here and around the world, uh, what observations might you share uh, with this younger generation of activists? Yeah, I mean, there have been a number of studies just in terms of 
numbers of people open and younger people overwhelmingly um, are critical of capitalism and don't see it as a system they want to invest in. And I think it is as much the hope of the failures of capitalism and the hope of socialism, this enormous wealth disparity, the callous disregard for human life, the uh, growing prison industry, which is, you know, being shrunk ever so slightly, but, you know, the kind of carceral logic of this society that people are pushing back against. But yeah, I mean, the world has a lot to teach us, you know, what's happening in Latin America uh, right now, and there's been ebbs and flows. We, of course, have a Bolsonaro in Brazil. At the same time, we have an amazing people's movement that has persevered and, and fought and continues to fight. Um, I even think, you know, the Zapatista lessons in, in Chiapas is uh, an important one. The uh, Rojava women in Northern Syria, the Kurdish area of Northern Syria, who are experimenting with this kind of confederalism, this kind of decentralized form of, of feminist socialism, they call it. Now, you know, they are in a very, very dangerous and hard situation, but the fact that these ideals you know, are appealing and are being experimented with in all of these places that are so much in flux. You know, I think our sources uh, of inspiration. And of course, uh, I think you and I may have seen each other last when, when, when I was in Cuba and when you yes. were in Cuba. Uh, you know, Cuba, Cuba is, is an interesting example. I mean, the fact that Cuban doctors have gone all around the world, the fact that Cuba has uh, exhibited solidarity for so many struggles in the African continent throughout its history, this tiny little nation, you know, the fact that illiteracy has been obliterated, uh, you know, in, in, in the country. Now, people have suffered under a terrible embargo. And, um, you know, that has, you know, that has held them back, you know, in a lot of ways and, and created suffering. And I think we have to say at the same time, that revolutions are not utopias that, you know, presto changeo, everybody doesn't become perfect overnight. So there is there racism in Cuba? I think, yes, there is still racism in Cuba. And we can say that understanding still that Cuba has made enormous strides, uh, in, you know, in, in, in terms of advancing the cause of human equality and, and freedom. Uh, there has been homophobia in Cuba. And up until very recently, that was not discussed and acknowledged. That's a problem. Um, so we have to be able to say these things because we are human beings trying to change the world. We're not robots changing the world. We're not prophets and messiahs and, you know, angels and gods. We are human beings. Um, and so I think uh, with great humility, because we haven't made any revolution here, uh, but right. with great humility, we have to look around the world and see what progress has been made and also what um, challenges and mistakes have been encountered. So. Thank you, Dr. Barbara Ransby, uh, for sharing with us um, your views and your time on this New World Coming program. Thank you for all that you do, James. You're really just a wonderful inspiration to all of us as well. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for watching this interview between historian, author, and activist Barbara Ransby and James Early. In this interview, Barbara and James discussed how heteropatriarchy is baked into the exploitative and oppressive system of capitalism that we face today, and how black feminism is an essential part of the continued influence of the black radical tradition. They delve into the inherent class dimension of the Black Lives Matter movement and what it means for her as a historian to stay embedded in grassroots movements and struggles. They also talk about how to facilitate intergenerational exchange in the fight against racial capitalism and white supremacy, and how solidarity and internationalism must be a part of our vision for total liberation. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see future events and discussions, and check out our political education platform to read more about the concepts in this episode. Go to politicaleducation.peoplesforum.org. Thank you, and see you next time. Where you gonna be standing when it comes?